and um, it, it's told from a wood pigeon. It's, it's got this beautiful metallic green sheen on on the on the nape, but it hasn't got the white collar. And um, when you see them flying, I always think that wood pigeon looks like its bill's pointing outwards, whereas stock dove looks like it's flying and it's facing the ground. That's how I personally see them. So um, with with stock dove, they're on the amber list, but it's not because of any particular issue in the UK. It's actually because they are of in international importance. So the UK is internationally important for stock doves. And so they're on amber list because of that. Now, Stock doves, when we look at when, when monitoring really got going um, in, in the 60s and 70s, stock doves were an all-time low as far as we can tell. And this was because they suffered very high mortality in their 1950s and 60s in particular when seeds were dressed uh, in farming. Seeds were dressed with organochlorines, which pretty much poisoned stock doves. Um, interestingly, stock doves use nest boxes um, very much like a kestrel nest box and they respond very positively to them and uh, there's there's lots of pairs using nest boxes they also use our nest boxes and so there's there's no reason to see why this increase this very steady increase cannot keep happening um, and uh, yeah certainly uh, their their nesting success is increasing all the while so quite a quite a good success um, this this species. Okay, so this is a little ID challenge for folks. So this here is a reed warbler nest, and you've got the four eggs that we can see are all blue, all one size. And then something else has laid its egg in there. It looks a little bit similar, and this was enough to fool the host of the of the nest. So this is reed warbler's nest and it's got a cuckoo egg inside. And this is the cuckoo where it's half grown being fed by the host, which is the reed warbler. Now cuckoos will parasitize, lay their eggs in various other species nests. So they will, reed warbler is the most common, but they will also lay their eggs in dunnocks, uh, tree pipits, and also meadow pipits. And they have been known to go in other species as well. Um, but reed warbler is, is the most, but you've got plenty of dunnocks in, in and around hazelands. And um, there is a chance that, that cuckoos could parasitize those. So when a cuckoo grows up, it grows to this rather magnificent uh, uh, male here that was uh, ringed just in, in Swindon. But actually, cuckoos are on a free fall, a really, really devastating population decline. And um, so they're, they're on the red list. There are estimated to be about 16,000 pairs in the UK. And it's again, it's proven actually very difficult to try and work out what the clear reasons for decline are. And it is presumed that the, the main challenges that they face are on the wintering grounds. And that is due to loss of habitat um, in the sub-Sahel region of Africa, but also in sort of, sort of changes in weather, cold weather, weather storms, things like this. And in particular, tracking of, of cuckoos with satellite transmitters has shown that they suffer particularly badly on their northward migration. And it is, it's, it's thought that potentially the widening of, of the Sahara Desert um, is having a major impact upon their ability to return to the UK. But there is also a thought that they, they could be struggling in the UK a bit due to the reduction in their um, prey species, which are, uh, tend to be macro moths, as is, as is thought. So, um, yeah, cuckoo's got a real, real, real problem. And another bird that is suffering a little bit recently is a tawny owl. And this uh, tawny owls are still about 50,000 pairs in the UK. And in the last 10 years, they have uh, declined by a, a further 6%. So there, there is a bit of a concern about tawny owls. But the problem is when it comes to censusing things like owls, because they're nocturnal, they're not often picked up on a lot of surveys. So the data is is pretty poor 
on on tawny owls and more monitoring is known uh, is is needed and so actually the reasons for their um, slight decline is actually unknown now just worth bearing in mind that obviously these nest naturally in holes in old trees but if you're planting a new woodland then maybe putting up a telegraph pole with a nest box on or or on a nearby tall tree these will take to um, nest boxes quite readily so as you can see the tawny owl has suffered this very very slow um, shallow decline but it, it just keeps going there seems to be no change so this is this is a real concern Okay, so this is a very iconic bird, mostly known for its beautiful song. And you've, you've had these recorded, I believe, very, very close to Hazelands. And um, when I first heard that they might be near Hazelands, I, I was a bit sceptical. Um, but actually, then I saw the map and realised that they have been. This photograph is, is very interesting because this is actually a bird that I ringed in Gambia. And these birds are on the coastal strip of Gambia. And a piece of scrub where I ring this bird now no longer exists. And the nightingales of this particular area only occur in the first 150 metres of land. And this has been cleared to create a mosque, which is incredibly sad for, for the nightingales. They still exist in the area, but not so many. So it, 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 winter habitat loss is a real problem for nightingales, but also... These nest on the ground, they nest on the bare ground underneath a canopy, a tight canopy of, of thorn bushes, normally bordered from the side by things like bramble and gorse and things like this. So they're actually very protected. And deer grazing has been shown to open up their nesting areas, which then exposes a nest and causes nest failure. So, so nightingale is... is, is at such a low ebb, it's the, the, the decline has happened much more in the west of the country. So this is the whole of Wiltshire. There's a very small population at Cotswold Water Park. We now believe the ones on the Salisbury Plain, there might be one pair, if any. I don't know about these ones personally, but this is the circle here where Hazelands is. So I don't know the particular habitat there, but if you've still got Nightingale there, that's they're extremely important and, and valuable um, on a Wiltshire basis. And as you can see the decline here, there are now so, so few Nightingales left that we now think that there are probably only 5,000 pairs in the UK. So very, very sad loss of, of such a beautiful singer. And then the Barn Owl. Barn Owl, one of the most... Uh, recognizable birds uh, very well monitored throughout Wiltshire and uh, they, these are green listed and uh, but in in the 1930s they were estimated to be 12,000 pairs of barn owl in the UK um, and now there's 4,000 pairs but they're, but they're pretty stable and they fluctuate their numbers fluctuate on a cycle intertwined with voles um, but interestingly 80 percent of the barn owls nesting in the UK are actually in nest boxes. So again, putting a nest box up would be very valuable. Okay, now there are a lot of barn owls in Wiltshire because the Salisbury Plain, which is roughly here, the Salisbury Plain has got some of the best grassland anywhere in the UK, probably the best. So we have lots and lots of, of big nest box schemes for barn owls. And you can see that they're, they're going up in some areas, down in others. But Wiltshire is a very, very good county for barn owl. But interestingly, in the west of the county, it's a lot less recorded. Now, whether that's truth or whether that's that's not, I don't know. But Hazelands marked here doesn't actually seem to have any, but I, I'm sure they can't be that far away. And as you can see, actually, on the chart on the right-hand side, a, a general, they, they, they took a decline in, in the early 2000s, but a general increase. They do get hit by particularly wet and particularly cold winters. And then we have a major success. This is the black cap. So black caps are increasing enormously. There are about 1.2 million pairs in the UK. And believe it or not, this is a 300% increase since the 1970s. And, and in fact, in the last 10 years, they've increased by 69% across the UK. And 
it's it's not fully understood why they're why they're doing quite so well because a lot of their habitat has been browsed out by deer. But actually, they're they're taking up smaller and smaller patches of scrub where they're able, where they're where they're, uh, where they're managing to nest. But what they've done that other species haven't. They're they're arriving earlier with climate change, and they seem to be adapting quicker to climate change and to insects that react to climate change. So there's more to learn on this, but but very very fascinating bird, and now a, a very very common bird. And as you can see here, in in since the um, 1960s and 1970s, this just seems to be an inexorable increase in in black caps. So not everything's doom and gloom. There are some good news stories out there for for some of our birds. And another barnstorming success are goldfinches. Again, green listed. Another bird, 1.2 million pairs across the UK. Um, and again, 58% increase in the last 10 years. And it's, it's fairly clear that their success has been that they've adapted to feeding on garden bird feeders. And what they've also done, which is uh, quite interesting, is that they appear to have occupied the niche that's been left by the catastrophic loss of green finches that are a bigger bird and a bit more dominant at the bird feeders. So... So goldfinches seem to have profited from, from the decline. And then greenfinches crashed because of a disease called trichomonosis, which um, is, a, is a devastating disease that, that, that um, uh, affects their, their, their breeding passages. Um, but as you can see here, in, in the last sort of uh, uh, 30 years, they've just, they're just going up and up and up and up. And... You don't record these at Hazelands, but interesting, Little, uh, Little Egret is another huge success. And being as, you, as you've got a river down the Marden Valley, um, you'll get Little Egrets along there. These first arrived in the UK uh, in the 1950s. The first Wiltshire record was in 1992, and that was at Britford down here. And then... Um, as, as recently as about eight years ago, this is the population of, of, of little egrets um, of, around Wiltshire these days. And they're just increasing all the time. So again, they've, they've increased by 70% in the last 10 years. So they're, they're just doing better and better and better. So, so it's not all about things that are going down. And just to finish off um, and hopefully guide you into Nick's talk, the last great success um, of, of, of recent years. This is the ultimate introduction species um, where red kites have been reintroduced. There are only a few pairs left in Wales. Um, to be fair, Nick is the expert on, the, on, on red kites in Wiltshire. Um, and uh, you, you really can't go a day out in Wiltshire now without seeing a red kite. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fascinating and really good to hear quite a lot of cheering news as well as the uh... The, the, uh, the bad stuff but that's absolutely great okay um i know there are a few uh, points in the in the chat but we'll come to those afterwards if that's okay we'll go straight on to nick adams and thank you to nick for for being with us this evening um nick as i said is an independent ornithologist ornithologist and has is the leader of the wiltshire rapture rap rapture that would be good wouldn't it raptor raptor group uh, and has worked for many many uh, decades i think for the rspb so has a, again a really wide breadth of experience on this so um nick's going to talk particularly about raptors and game birds uh, which is a really pressing issue so over to you nick do you want to share your screen okay thank you very much thank you right hope you can see that so yeah, I'm not uh, to say I'm not in charge of the Wiltshire Raptor Group or the Rapture Group. <laughs> um, ju I'm just a member. Uh, so, so what I'm going to talk about today um, are the game birds, the varieties of game birds that we get around the Marden Valley, and the birds of prey that also sort of frequent that area. This is a picture from the very top. This is the catchment for the River Marden. This is sort of a view from Morgan's Hill, looking across towards Cheryl on an autumn day, if you get up early enough, that's the sort of view you can get. So the first one we'll start with is a uh, pheasant. Now, Matt mentioned that we've got about 83 million pairs of birds in the UK. In the autumn, 
the, the, the latest figures we have for pheasants are there were 51 million released in about 2018. That's the sort of numbers that we're getting put out now. So in the autumn, pheasants are the most common bird in the UK. Along the Marden, we get um, varieties of different game birds depending on the, the altitude really. So at the, at the source of the Marden, it's more partridge country. So we get um, gray partridge, red leg partridge up that way. And, and then as you come down through the woodlands, that's more pheasant country. So um, this is a fairly typical male. And there's a lot of different varieties of pheasant that are around. So it's quite a nice mix of colors on that one. But this one's one of my favorites, I have to say. <laughs> this is a it's Japanese green um, pheasant. And you, you just look at him, he knows he's great. And uh, the way he's strutting across there, even posed for me to take the picture. And like, yeah, a quick apologies. These are all my pictures and none of them are uh, as good as Matt's. So uh, apologies for that. <laughs> Moving on. So another bird that's released um, into the countryside for for shooting um is uh, this is a red leg partridge i think this one's had a close run in with somebody it's got a bit of a few feathers missing on the neck there um there's about 10 million or so of these released in the countryside in the uk for shooting um along the marden both species i it's hard to be 100 percent sure but somewhere in the region of five to ten thousand i would think are released every year Right, moving quickly on. So, okay, so moving on to sort of more um, wild birds. Um, so this is um, a great partridge, it's a pair. Male on the right there, you can kind of see the black on his chest and a slightly brighter head than the female. So great partridges are, there's gosh, there's definitely some pairs at the top of the Marden, around the catchment for the top. I've, I've seen them this year, I've seen cubbies, so family groups possibly five to 10 pairs, something like that. These are on the red list that Matt talked about before. These are one of our, what we call an arable priority species. So it's, it's one of our absolute primary species in a farming environment that we're trying to do work to help them. Reasons for decline would be to do with loss of, um, sort of nesting habitat, they nest in sort of tusky grass along the edge of hedgerows and things like that. and through the common agricultural policy, a lot of these hedgerows were removed because farmers were being penalised for having non-productive areas. Um, so they, they were sort of almost forced to remove some of these hedgerows. So this is the sort of stuff that's impacted these guys. And um, but now, now people are being um, paid to replace them. So it's good. And they're coming back and we're putting in lots more features and fields for them. And I'm starting, I Starting to see a few more, I think. So um, fingers crossed that they'll, they'll do okay. And they're very sneaky. They don't fly, they don't run with the red leg partridge. They fly to the sides and the red leg partridge fly straight. So if they were caught kind of near some, some shooting, they all fly away to the sides. They're very sneaky. So that they're, I think that's why we, we release red leg partridge because it's tricky to shoot. Moving on. So this is actually, is a game bird. So um, this is a, a female great busted. We do get occasional wanderers into the Marden. So again, the upper catchment of the Marden Valley. This is a young female. I just, I, this is a picture I took along a, a road I was driving along and all of a sudden this thing stood up. And I, I, just for a comparison to a pheasant. So we know how big a male pheasant is and you can see she, he, she, he's barely up to the top of her legs. And the male busted's about 50% bigger. So what, um, what she's doing is she's a young bird. She's just looking around for somewhere to breed. So this um, last year, we had a female who wandered up through the Marden, across the top of the Marden Valley and all the way up to north of Swindon, um, looking around for a place. And then she wandered back to the release site down on Salisbury Plain. With, it's probably, again, a hard one to judge. Exactly, even though they're massive birds, they're brilliant at hiding. They lay flat on the ground, neck out to, to avoid detection um, there's possibly about 100 birds now from the, the reintroduction scheme on Salisbury Plain still alive out there which is getting to a, you know a good sized population now we're hoping soon to be able to show that there's, there's some of the 
chicks that have successfully been reared in the wild have actually then gone on to breed. And once you've got grandchildren, you know, you're really ticking that last box on the sort of success sort of uh, checklist for the reintroduction. But an I, I, yeah, iconic Wiltshire bird on the flag and everything. So it be much better than that. So um, there are a couple of other, uh, well, one other um, game bird to quickly mention, which is quail. I haven't got a picture of a quail because they are blooming good at hiding. Um, we do get quail there again around the top of the mud and in the fields around there. I, I, they were singing up there this year. They were quite an eruptive species coming in from Africa and they kind of work their way up through Europe just sort of trying to breed, finding places. Some years they get to us, some years they don't. But um, yeah, just a few in a good year around the top of the margin. So quickly moving on to birds of prey. Now we get a lot of different types of birds of prey and that's because we've got a lot of good things for them to eat in, in the areas uh, all along the margin. So buzzards will be right through the whole area. I took this picture just to show you the sort of, it's not even the scale, the range of variation in plumage. The one on the left is a pale bird. That was reported to me several times as an osprey. Um, they used to sit by, sit by the um, gallops at Beckhampton on a, on a post and people kept reporting seeing a, an osprey there because it's just so white on the front. And the one on the right is a more standard colored one with that kind of, uh, it's got kind of a horseshoe sort of shape at the base of the throat there. So that they do particularly well in sort of mixed farmland. Um, most, you, this time of year, you'll see them all sat in fields, picking up worms, because a lot of worms being washed to the surface at the moment. And there will be a lot of game birds getting killed on roads at this time of year when the shooting season finishes. They tend to start wandering, looking for food more. And the buzzards um, benefit from that as well. But as, as Matt's already said, doing doing very well. So they were, they arrived back in Wiltshire in the, for me in about the mid eighties. Um, and then they, they, they were the first bird back in this kind of level of what I'd call sort of meso predators or mid predator carrion eater level above crows in the food chain. And they had it to themselves until about 10, 15 years ago when the kites and the ravens started to arrive back. And these are all in the same sort of level of the food chain. There's a big turf war really going on now. And we'll end up with a few of each because um, a good pair of kites is going to see off a, a rubbish pair of buzzards and vice, yeah, vice versa. So we'll end up, it will settle down and we'll end up with a few less buzzards, but we'll have a nice mix of different species. So this is a, a male peregrine. This is a one, he's actually sat on the church in Cal there. He spotted me, I think. Um, he hunts uh, all through the Marden. Um, one of my jobs when I used to live in Calm, I used to go around and cleaning up the churchyard um, to, and sort of picking up all the, de the detritus that he drops. And so he's really interesting kind of see what he eats. And he's he's taken stuff um, from sort of varieties of duck through wood. He loves a woodpecker, does like a, especially green woodpeckers, jays. Um, they're, jays and, and green woodpeckers are quite slow, ponderous flyers. So for a, a, a fellow like him, it's an easy kill and it's a you know, big piece of meat. Um, jackdaws, things like that, through to even um, woodcock and coot. It, it was a dead, even took a coot. Um, it's a quite a big bird for him. Um, the female is probably the one, his female is probably the one that roosts in Lynham, on MOD Lynham, there's one on the water tower. I think it's the pair. I've seen her, I've seen a ring, she's ringed. I've seen a ringed female at Cowan and I've seen a male looking, unringed male, which she is, up at Lynham. And I I think it's a, the same pair. They disappear, disappear out to breed and then they come back and they've wintered like this for seven years that I've been in the area. And we've probably got about 10 pairs now breeding in Wiltshire, yeah. but we're, we're seriously lacking in habitat, um, nesting habitat. Um, for them, they need sort of, you know, sort of um, very quiet, high places like the church at Calm is just too low. He'd be, he'd, he tolerates you in the winter. He'd be going mental at us if we were there, if he was there during the breeding season. So, um, yeah, that's him. Um, so kestrels. This is a, I think a young female kestrel. So kestrels breed 
the full length of the Marden, really. Um, the numbers have they've struggled a little bit um, in recent years. And it's a weird one because we used to see them a lot. People say, oh, I used to see them on motorways and things like that, and I don't see them there anymore. Well, that's kind of a good sign because that's the worst place to hunt if you're a, a kestrel. That wind whipping them into, you get a lorry go by, kind of impacts and they get whipped into the road and hit by something else. And that was almost the only pieces of unmanaged grassland that we had were along main roads. And that's why they were there. So farmers are doing a lot more stuff. All the stuff that Matt mentioned that's helped our is, is helping kestrels are hunting the same stuff, but they're still declining. So there's, there's another plea for a nest box. I would definitely be thinking about kestrel nest boxes as well um, in that sort of hazeland area. Be a good one to do. And one of my favorite stories about kestrel is how they hunt. So they can see in the ultraviolet as a lot of birds can. And what they're doing, you see them hovering and you're thinking, oh, they're just looking at some grass. But no, what they've done is they've picked out the best place to hunt for. So mice and voles that are kind of going through tunnels in the grass, so they're almost incontinent. And so they're running along and there's stuff dribbling out all the time as they're running through. So that and the ammonia they can pick up as they're looking down in the ultraviolet. So the brightest places are the places where the voles are going the most. And that's the bits they're watching. So that it's not random all this stuff when they're just hovering. It's proper proper science going on there. So. And they nest in boxes. So here we go. So this is what I want to see down on the hazeland. A couple of little faces there, sort of looking out the box. So this picture, sorry again, apologize for my pictures, um, but I, I put it in because it's a comparison. So the front bird's a young kestrel, and the back bird's a young sparrowhawk. This is. Took this at the end of August this year, up at, up at this, again, up at the source near Morgan's Hill. It was a wet day with a sort of northerly wind and it's just blowing up the hill and the whole sort of rear hillside was covered in young birds of prey or learning how to fly. So the front bird is the kestrel, so really pointy wings. And um, the back bird is the sparrowhawk, so it's got cur the wings more curved and you can see fingers at the end there, you can see that the primary feathers sticking out, whereas that kestrel is just a pointy wing. But I thought that that's a, that's a young female kestrel. She's slightly bigger than a male, and that's a young male sparrowhawk who's slightly smaller than a female sparrowhawk. So they, you can see the size is pretty similar, but just looks a bit more bulky, a sparrowhawk. So the, again, I haven't got any good pictures of sparrowhawk. I, you know, so this is a sparrowhawk kill. <laughs> I thought I'd show you this. I do. When you're out and about, you'll see piles of feathers, and it's interesting, I think, to try and work out who's doing what, and it gives you an idea who's in the area. So this, this is a sparrowhawk kill of one of Matt's stock doves, I'm afraid. Um, it's not on the edge of a woodland that I was surveying along. And the reason I can, two things tell me it's a sparrowhawk. One is a sparrowhawk feather. <laughs> Just there it drops while it was um, plucking the bird. But all the feathers are plucked. So you can kind of they're spread out and you, you can imagine this bird there just sort of plucking away, pulling out feathers and then carrying off the sparrowhawk, um, carrying off the stock dove to its chicks. If that was the only other thing that's really going to do something like that, other than another bird of prey would be something like a fox or a badger. And they tend to bite feathers out. So you'll see clumps of feathers. You won't just see all this nicely plucked stuff. And if there's primaries and tail feathers, you'll see they're bitten off at the quill tip. Whereas if there, are, uh, there aren't any in that picture, but if there were primaries and tail feathers there, they, they'd be the whole quill, like the, like the sparrowhawk feather there. You can kind of see it's got the whole tip there and all the feathers would look like that. And that's how you know it's a, a bit of prey kill. So um, this is a very special little fella. This is a, a Merlin. Um, it's a male in pretty much full plumage. So it's all bluey gray back and he's got orangey front. Now we, again, we get Merlin along, it's on, it's on, it's on the sort of top end of the Marden and in the middle. So I've seen them regularly hunting along Morgan's Hill where they're hunting some of the small species like meadow pipits that feed in that area, skylarks. But I've also seen them hunting sort of towards the bowwood sort of part of the Marden. And again, hunting small birds like finches and meadow pipits 
they are a northern raptor. They head south when the metapipids head south, probably just following them for like a packed lunch, really, I suppose, a flock of, of meadow pipits. And um, they, um, they breed them, um, gosh, the, the, the most southerly pair that breed probably around Staffordshire at the moment, but we periodically they have bred in Wiltshire. There's the only place in southern England they do breed occasionally. Probably once every three or four years, we'll, we'll, we'll see a chick or we'll see adults carrying food or something like that. And they're breeding out on Salisbury Plain somewhere. Um, never quite found them yet. We'll find them one day. Okay. Um, so, as Matt mentioned, red kite. So, I've put again a rubbish picture of a red kite, um, mostly because I wanted to sort of try and show you a picture of a kite without showing you the tail. So, you can actually see the shape of those wings. So it's a, how the wings are curving down. The, the, the wing tips are, are almost facing downwards. They're not, a buzzard's wings kind of face up. And these guys are almost like, it's a vulture-like sort of wing shape. So very different, very slow flaps, big languid flaps, slow moving bird. It is a, just, it's our vulture really, the way they're doing. So they've, they've spread in brilliantly. And probably in the time I've lived in, in around Cal in the last seven years. When I first arrived, I'd see the odd one. I'd see them most days, but it'd only be the odd one. And now if I chose to go somewhere like down towards Lower Compton or again on a nice windy day up at the source of the, the margin, I've counted over 20 going just along the ridge past me. When the wind's right, they're just drifting out, hunting the areas. They do enjoy um, a game shoot and um, some of the keepers like gamekeepers I know use kites as an indication of how good the guys are at picking up all the birds so if the kites are finding birds that have been shot the guys who pick up get telling off because they're not doing a good job so the, the, the way they spread really from the releases that were done seems to be to have followed major roads near large game shoots which suggests they, they like roadkill which they feed a lot on but again they'll be down fighting with the buzzards for the worms and they from when I first arrived I think there was possibly one pair along the margin that I could find breeding there's eight, there's in, well in excess of 10 now um and which is a you know brilliant thing to see and we're probably getting close to sort of capacity for breeding population now and what we might then see is a lot of the the, the, the sheer numbers that we see, and most of those are young birds, and they'll slowly get sort of nudged away from us. They'll get nudged probably more towards Chippenham as the range kind of expands that way. But uh, yeah, a brilliant success story. So this this um, fellow in this picture is um, a young male hen harrier. So he's flying again this is this is just down from Morgan so I took this a few years ago if you can kind of see in the middle of his back it's a bit dark um, and the wings are kind of grey and the black wing tips and you see that white rump as well so the dark back tells me he's what I'd, I'd call him a third calendar year so he would be so he's, he's now in his what fourth calendar year now so he would be like a 2018 chick if it was this year and he'll molt out to having a pure grey wing, pure grey back, and that centre of the tail, which is a bit dark now as well, that'll go pure grey as well. Now, I've put this in as well because of the area he's hunting over. So he's hunting over a cover that's um, put in for shooting up by Morgan's Hill. But if it's not maize, if you look, that's not maize he's hunting over. It's the tall stuff that's kind of leaning over is a thing called triticale. The green stuff is kale. And the, 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 the cover has strips of maize and then a strip of wild bird cover. So it's a kind of 50-50 strip. Now this was a conversation that I had up there, oh gosh, five years ago probably now, when the first year the maize failed when I first went there and the, the gamekeeper had put in this cover of all this stuff. And, and he said, you put it in quick because the maze failed and he was just looking for something to grow for a cover for his game birds. And I used to stand and look at this and it'd be full of small birds like linnets, reed buntings, corn buntings, yellow hammers. And it was hundreds and hundreds of them there. And I would just sort of point this out and then we'd go and look at it. And then 
I, you know, the season finished for me being up there and I came back the next year and it was all stripey. And I said, oh, what have you done? He said, well, I listened to what you said and I've put in 50-50 this year so we can, everybody gets a bit. And that's what we, and that's the way it's always been since then. And, and hopefully it will continue where, you know, they're doing these conversations with people who are working with game birds about these birds of prey and then we, you know, we get positive things to do. So we have conversations where I'll, I'll say where I think all the pheasants have gone on that and I'll be told where where the peregrine was hunting last, you know, and things like that. And it's almost a role reversal for a lot of the conversations we have, but it's, you know, it can be very positive when the two things come together like that. So I think that's probably me done. Thank you very, very much, Nick. Hey, sorry, un- never shot a un- uh, Cheryl Monument there again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to unshare your screen and then I think we'll get back to the yeah. main room. Is that all right? Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, so just, um, I think there's quite a few questions in the in the chat room there. Um, just just to pick up on some of the bits about Hazen, first of all, just to say that um, we are, we've actually had a raptor survey there and we are certainly um, planning to put in tawny owl boxes and possibly a barn owl box. We haven't thought about kestrel boxes yet. That one hadn't uh, uh, crossed our vision, but uh, I guess it may be something to think about. And also just to say that, it, of course, Hazeland is already has 10 acres of ancient woodland there so it's not that we're entirely uh, reliant on posts and so on we may end up doing that but we actually have a lot of old wood a lot of old sandy wood wood and we're, we're doing our best to look after it and I can see some of our neighbours are in the chat room there um, uh, in the audience and I know that they're they've also uh, taken on board the issues about um, putting up boxes for, for owls and so on. So, okay, so I'll have a look in the chat room there and just see what uh, what questions we've got. Um, well, there's one actually from one of our, our first of all, from one of our um, trustees, Andy, basically asking Matt and Nick, what would you see as the priorities for hedgerow and woodland bird conservation in Wiltshire and in particular in the Marden? What, what you know, what would, what are the things that you'd be, uh, encouraging us to do well when you're planting a woodland i i think that uh, to keep it irregular i've seen too many uh, newly planted woodlands that are just in straight lines all the tree guards on them and also no regard given to understory planting mm. all of the the sort of lower plants the the sort of flowering plants as well because you want insects there but you have to start the food chain off um, but then things like bramble and and stuff like that so straight from a woodland perspective that's what i see nick yeah yeah i think so with the woodland the mature woodland you've got there's an opportunity sadly coming our way through ash dieback as well so mm-hmm. yeah just i i if you can always try and leave the trees if they're not in a they're not going to be an issue where they are because we need to find the ones that are going to survive i've seen too many woodlands where people have just taken them all out just in case and it's just i mean to get into a woodland to take out all the ash trees that are dotted through there randomly is, is causing so much damage um yeah. so if it, but it will bring thinning and it will bring that structure that matt's talking about as well so it'll let light in yeah. and it's an opportunity just to have some standing deadwood which the species um like um marsh tip that matt mentioned they love yeah. standing deadwood yeah. to make their nests yeah. in so we, we can have lots of things like that out there. So yeah. what, what they've done in some areas, Nick, is is that where possible, try and try and leave the standing dead wood as high as you can if it's out of a public area. If it's near a public area, maybe cut it off at about eight foot high so you've still got some dead wood stood in a yeah, safe manner. Absolutely. I've done the same. And I, I've even put it on fence posts. So I've even put a fence <laughs> post in the ground and attached a piece of dead wood to it. Yeah. If it's impossible to, you know, if, got, if it's a tree that's just in the way for, for somebody doing something, just move it. Yeah. There's, there's ways of doing it. Just got to think a bit laterally. And then yeah. with hedgerows, and then with hedgerows, mm-hmm. you say about that. I mean, Nick and I, we've known each other a long time, and hedgerows are so important. Um, they're the lifeblood. They're they're how the bats move along. They're they're what insects will move along. Um, 
But we've also seen some terrible hedgerows in Wiltshire and we've seen some brilliant ones and um, sort of things like so. So making sure that, that, that you're connecting woodlands with hedgerows so that things mm. like marsh tits can disperse amongst them. And then mm. but there's nothing wrong with hedgerow management, but maybe like have it as a, as a high A frame with a wide base and a narrow top, maybe cut it on a three year cycle. So you cut it one side one year, the top another year, the other side the third year, things like that. So there's always berries available. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, lots of uh, actually, I think you'll be you must come to Hazen. I don't think you've been there yet, but um, just to say, there's only a very, uh, very sort of small area where we're planting regular uh, lines of trees, and that's because, or not even lines, but that's more because um, that area has been given over to university research on tree growth and carbon sequestration. The vast majority of the area that we're planting is is much more, you know, uh, much more sort of random. Uh, patterns and of course a huge area we're actually leaving to rewild and a large area is just scrub and then we're also just because the ecologists have told us that the grass is species rich we're leaving that as glades uh, and the riverside meadow is being left alone as well so it really is a really good um mosaic of habitats you know so um so i think you'd be quite pleased i think we're but you know we're always we could be keen to have you on site to give us a bit more advice as well um but anyway, hopefully some of those thoughts are, are useful for other people uh, in the audience and, and thinking about how they plan their planting uh, and so on. Um, other questions. Uh, first question, is it normal for tawny owls and barn owl chicks to eat each other? Um, Taw tawny owl would win, but go, go on, Nick, go, go on. Sorry, yeah, okay. Um, barn owl chicks will eat barn owl chicks. Tawny owl chicks will eat tawny owl chicks normally. Um, right. and, and that's based on how much food availability there is. So they, they all, um, birds of prey, all um, start sitting on eggs when they've laid two eggs and they'll lay a number more. Yep. And then when they hatch out, you get that kind of Russian doll effect of birds of different ages. And if there's enough food, they'll all survive. And if there isn't, junior is a meal, to be honest. Um, then once they fledge, then, you know, juvenile barn owls, uh, there's potential for, I would have said, for an adult tawny owl to possibly have a go at one but they're not really in the same habitat they tend to be further apart you know tawny owls are largely around woodland and barn owls are largely away from woodland right. but certainly there's an issue with well it's not an issue it's it's it's, it's um, nature that the you know the siblings will eat each other yeah but if okay. but if tawny and barn owl do clash the tawny will win it's a bigger stronger bird yeah Right. OK. Um, and somebody's commented that they do have a barn owl at Titherton Lucas, which is very close to us. So I don't know if you uh, know about that. Um, but uh, um, somebody else has asked about parakeets. Uh, have I got this question right? Sorry, I'm having a little bit of computer problem here. Could so uh, yeah. uh, have we got parakeets in the area? There's, I, I noticed recently there's been a few sightings on, on the Calm Wildlife Facebook page. Right. Um, there's there was a, a lot of skates probably in the 70s now um, in London and around the southeast and they've started to breed really well and they're spreading west. There's sporadically being seen and, and they're an issue for whole nesting species because they'll, they'll nest in a hole in a tree so there'd be another problem for things like starling and they would start to compete with great spotted woodpeckers for nesting sites. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see. Hang on. I have another question here, Nikki. That yeah, I actually, got... Susan, can I ask you to take yes. over the question? Because I'm having <laughs> some bit of um, IT problems yeah, growing no, up. No, not to worry. Is that okay? So, um, yes, of course. Richard has asked In what sense does the rearing of game birds unbalance the local ecology? Should they be kept out of Hazeland? Um, okay, I'll, I'll go at that. <laughs> I think you, you'd well firstly I, th I don't think you can you wouldn't be able to keep them out anyway um, and it's all all of these things are about sort of numbers really so um, I don't think the current releases around that area are a, a significant number I don't see a lot of birds and um, I don't currently think it's an issue um, they are going to you know there's food put out for them um, they'll eat that, but there will be a, some eating of invertebrates. I know that I particularly watch them chasing crane flies and things like that in the autumn, which they seem to love. Um, so that there will be some impact, but I, I don't think it's going to be a significant impact for you because it's just not, I mean, it's, the density of release is, is very low compared to some sites I go to. 
Good, good to know. Thank you. Um, someone else has asked, Helen has asked, what is the status of kingfishers? Is that particularly relevant? Can anyone speak? I can do to that. that? Um, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, there's there's a pair that I there's a pair that breeds kind of um, near Black Dog, and um, so just up from Hazeland, and they wander certainly up into castle fields and things like that. I think it's the same pair. And there's, you see them all up the Marden, way past um, Calm. And certainly I've seen, yeah, I've seen them further down as well. So I think they're doing okay. Um, it's because it's quite a fast river. Um, you get, um, and, and it's, it hasn't been canalized too much. So on the bends, you get a nice bank. The outside um, wall of the bend will, will wear sort of really steep. And that's just the sort of place a kingfish is looking to nest. So yeah, I think they're okay. Okay, good. Good to know. Um, John has asked, what type of trees would most help with declining bird species, appreciating that hedgerows and wildflowers contribute to the ecosystem? So any thoughts on any particular trees for any of the birds you've talked about this evening? In the in the woodland, um, things like hazel. Hazel is, is very good for, for marsh tit in particular, and particularly if it's sort of married on a bit of a coppice cycle. Um, but uh, yeah, so so hazel is very good. Birch is is good, and birch is good for a lot of stuff because it's a soft wood, so birds can bore, um, you know, holes into it. So so that's 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 also excellent. Um, ash obviously is dying, so that's that's a bit of a problem. When it comes to, I mean, and and just from a pure density of insects in the autumn, I, I mean, I. Uh, sallow uh, is is very good and and I'm personally a big fan of elder although a lot of people aren't farmers aren't because it breaks up hedgerows but actually elder is is very very important in autumn migration um, for birds personally speaking uh, when I check hedgerows for uh, for nests as I sort of do as part of the nest record scheme um, by far the most common bush that I will find nests in is hawthorn by by a long long way um but i'm also a massive fat fan of blackthorn i, I have to admit i i can't uh, talk about blackthorn enough i love it and i love the way actually as it starts to sucker out it almost wanders into a field i think blackthorn's brilliant that's that's great that's some really specific uh, interesting examples there i think um we're pretty much out of time so i'm sorry if we haven't got to everyone's questions lots of really interesting questions i'm one last quick one someone has asked are there any hobbies oh yeah there are i i just haven't got a good picture of one <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's a pair there's definitely a pair of breeds at the north end of the um sort of top of the upper part of the marden and i've seen them further down but i've not sort of seen them breeding and they definitely come through a lot on passage again they kind of follow the they, they, they migrate down to africa for the winter and they follow down the swallow and the martin flock, so um, back down to South Africa. But yeah, definitely are, yeah. Could I fire a quick question uh, or a point to Nick, please? Uh, Nick, you know my interest in uh, little owls. Yeah. Would you like to um, say just a little bit on little owls, please? Sure, yeah, so little owl, um, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting one. So they're, they're actually what we'd call blacklisted, so they're not even on green, amber, or red lists, and that's caused them quite a problem. So they're, they're actually an introduced species from Victorian times. Because they were never here, they've never actually made it onto a list, which means when it comes to doing research into issues that they're having, people aren't got interested in funding it because it just they just don't appear on a list. Um, in the last 20 years, the numbers have just gone through the floor and... Mm -hmm. And it's really odd because you'd think that with the, the stuff that farmers are doing now, increasing all these margins and putting in lots of areas of nectar and pollen, there should be more beetles and insects for them to feed on. And it just doesn't seem to be having a positive impact. So other reasons for a decline would, could be predation. It could be predation pressure from, I guess, species like buzzard and perhaps um, if you think of a species that's come in in that period personally I've never seen that um, I, so I'm just kind of guessing but I, there's, I think that this problem is we can't get any funding to do any research into them so it's going to need somebody who's just loves, loves um, little I was going to pay for some research into to see what the real decline reason is 
I am you can add a little bit about little owls, yeah, because I've I've got about sixty nest boxes up for them, and uh, with a very very low take up, but um, we've only got about three pairs of little owls in our boxes. So the adults are staying um, faithful to those boxes for about five or six years on the whole. Um, some years they nest in the box, some years they nest in the tree and back in the box afterwards. Um, they don't seem to have very, very good nesting success. So we, we tend to get one to two uh, chicks and then the rest they eat themselves. So food availability could be an issue. Um, but also is that we've never had one of our nestlings recovered elsewhere. And I know there's a big study on the Solzhu plane that's kind of found the same. And um, the, the PhD that was done seemed to say it was first year survival. They, they really feel that got very poor first year survival. And I have actually seen Little Owl being taken by Buzzard twice. Both times Little Owl sat on the, sat on the barn roof and both times Buzzard came, came in and it was no competition at all. It was very, very quick. Okay, I think we probably need to, to wrap it up there. But I just want to say a really, really big thanks to both our speakers. That's really useful. I have a terrible confession. I don't think we recorded this, did we, Susan? Well, I have a terrible confession is in that we recorded it except for the first five minutes oh. because <laughs> I thought I'd set it to automatically record and I realised with a panic five minutes in that it wasn't. So right. to the people who've asked that they've missed the first bit and have we recorded it? Yes but not the bit you missed so the, but there is a recording of the, of the majority of the talk I think we missed your introduction Nikki and just the first bit of Matt so oh that's really fine. sorry yeah, about okay. that, everybody but there is the bulk of it will be we'll put that out there yeah we'll have a look and we'll we'll put it on our website and of course if you're subscribed to our news email then you'll you'll certainly get it through there as well um so again, a very, very big thanks. What I would say, there was just a couple of questions in the chat about access to Hazeland and how you can get out there. Because we only bought it in August and we're still doing work on it in terms of public safety and in terms of the biodiversity and working out what, what on earth we've got there. Um, it's what we call managed access. So it's not just open for you to walk onto the site at the moment. Uh, and really Susan's job is all about setting up a whole uh, raft of wonderful events, including bird monitoring events, a spring watch event, a big butterfly count all sorts of things which you would be really really uh, welcome to 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 it participate in so if you're interested in that please do sign up to the newsletter it's the best way to find out about what we've got in the pipeline obviously covid is uh messing things up slightly at the moment but we're particularly to keen to keep our bird data um going and, and and really um move that along and take regular surveys you know well documented surveys throughout the year so particularly we're particularly keen to hear about from people who are who have good bird ID skills and who can help us with that. But even if you're just an enthusiast and want to learn more, then we're really, really keen to hear from you. You can contact us through the website or you can just email Susan on hazeland at avonneedstrees.org.uk. So that's hazeland at avonneedstrees.org.uk um, and she'll keep you informed of what's happening. So I think, um, Susan, have we got anything to say about our next event? Because we're planning another another Zoom in about a month, yes? We do, that's right. Robert and I are working on this and that is going to be on Tuesday the uh, 9th of March. Correct me if I'm wrong at any point, Robert. And we're going to be looking at the um, water quality in the actual, the River Marden itself. So um, we're having someone come along from the uh, Bristol Avon Rivers Trust and also somebody from uh, Wiltshire Council's climate team to just really talk about the, the water quality in the Marden from, from source to, to uh, where it joins the Avon. So if that sounds of interest, that's going to be one of a series of talks through the each month we'll have one. I think um, we're still deciding April, May, we're going to be doing all about the trees and the tree planting and the carbon capture with um, Thomas Jucker, our uh, research scientist from Bristol University. So we're really gonna keep this online uh, engagement going and focus on all the different uh, diversity and sustainability aspects of, of Hazen through the year. So keep your eyes out for those. Good, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, we'll wrap it up there and thank you very, very much for coming. If you have enjoyed it, feel free to drop us a donation on Ava Needs Trees. Um, you know, we're really looking forward to getting going on that second piece of land and doing, you know, really, really good things there. And generally going on piece after land or piece of land. There's a reason why we called our, ourselves even these trees. It's because we consider ourselves ants <laughs> and together doing small things one bit at a time, we will make an impact on our 
uh, Bristol Avon catchment area and hopefully wider than that. So, so thank you for your participation and your interest and yeah. uh, we look forward to seeing you soon in person, we hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.